All right, welcome everyone to our weekly Q&A with Toronto's Associate Medical Officer of Health. Dr. Vanita Dubey, thank you so much for joining us again today. Of course, thanks for having me. Absolutely. My name is Dilshad Berman. I am a writer and reporter with City News and 680 News, and I'll be moderating this chat today. The way it goes is we've been collecting your questions over the past week via our social media, as well as our website, and we're going to present them to the doctor today. She's never heard them before. If you haven't had a chance to submit questions, you can still do so under this live broadcast, and we're going to try and get to as many live questions as we can. Um, if we miss them, we'll try and get to them next week. That's what I've done this week as well. Questions from next week are featured in this week's uh, Q&A as well. So, doctor, are you ready to go? Yeah, let's go. Wonderful. So we're going to start with some vaccine questions. We've had a ton of them as usual because that's top of mind for everybody. So let's start off with our vaccine questions and then we'll get to all of the other questions as well. Um, starting off with Caesar. Um, Caesar asks, why are there so little uh, vaccination options for the 18 to 49 age group in hotspots uh, in Toronto Central? For M5A, there are only two small options with only 70 vaccines a day from Monday to Saturday. Uh, do you think this is acceptable? Well, I can tell you that uh, it's going to change. We're going to get more vaccines and we're going to be able to offer them to more people in hotspots. Right now, the hotspot strategy is actually focusing on 13 of all of the hotspots that are the highest of the hotspots. Right. And that's where a lot of the efforts are going. And so that's why it is more difficult in some of those other hotspot areas for 18 to 49 year olds. But in the coming weeks, we will get uh, much more vaccine. So, for example, this week in Toronto, we have about 100,000 doses. Next week, we will get 300,000 doses. And so that is going to make a big impact in being able to have people like you uh, very soon be able to get vaccine. Great. Um, and then let's see, Margo asks, can I get a different vaccine for the second dose? I'm not sure what the studies are showing right now. Uh, this is also Gail's question. If I had AstraZeneca vaccine for my first dose, can I get Pfizer for my second dose? So we're waiting for some more recommendations to come out from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization. That They are looking into this. We do know that the UK, for example, has done a study on this, has done one dose of AstraZeneca, one dose of Pfizer, and we'll be able to see what the science shows on that. And so there will be more guidance coming out before your second doses will be due. Right. So second doses are due in four months. And so by the time four months comes around, we should have some answers on this. That's right. So second doses by June, mo some people will be starting their second doses and we should have some um, more guidance on this by then. Excellent. Awesome. Okay. And then uh, this is a question from Anonymous. What is the worst side effect of any of the vaccines that we have recorded in Toronto or Ontario? Well, the, I mean, it's a loaded question, but I think the one side effect that is the most rare and the most serious is that side effect of the serious blood clots that occur after AstraZeneca. And there have been um, a few people in Toronto and Ontario who have had this, though it was detected early and they have uh, been treated. Uh, some are actually at home recovering. So that is one of uh, the side effects to watch for. It can be serious if not treated, but actually it is treatable. Okay. Um, and then uh, Hassan asks, uh, hi, Dr. Dubey, I am 42 years old. How can I get a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine if I don't want to get the AstraZeneca vaccine? Okay, so it depends on whether you're eligible now. Um, if you live in a certain hot spot, one of those hot of, hottest of hottest spots, one of the 13 areas, look for a pop-up clinic. Uh, just today, it was announced that if you live in any of the hot spots and are 45 and up, you can now book an appointment at any of uh, the city clinics. And so you can imagine now we're down to 45 in hot spots. We will slowly be uh, opening it up to more individuals. If you work as an essential worker by mid-May, which is actually just coming up, you will also be eligible uh, for vaccine uh, based on the rollout as well. Right. Okay. Um, but but in terms of picking the vaccine, because they don't want to take the AstraZeneca, they want to take. Oh, I see. OK, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the AstraZeneca is available right now in doctor's offices and pharmacies. And uh, for the most part, uh, it's 
Pfizer and Moderna that's being used at um, hospital clinics and Toronto Public Health clinics. There have been some pop-up clinics that have used AstraZeneca, but they have been clear that that's the vaccine that is being used. Going forward in the next couple of weeks, it's a lot of Pfizer that we're getting. And so that is going to be the, the major vaccine that is going to be available. Right. But in general, doctor, you've been mentioning that we should just take the first shot that's offered to us. Does that still stand? It is. We're certainly in a place in Toronto where the COVID rates are very high and we need to do whatever we can at an individual level, at a population level to prevent the spread of COVID. And so definitely there is uh, the benefits and risks balance that even for AstraZeneca, even with that rare side effect, it would be recommended that you get it. But I do recognize it's up to each individual to make that choice. I would recommend that if you have access to that vaccine, really consider it. But if you really made your mind up, I want you to know that there is a likelihood that you will get Pfizer. The National Advisory Committee on Immunization actually in their risk benefit talked about the benefits of getting AstraZeneca now versus waiting the many weeks that it might be for Pfizer. I mean, there is a risk in that. And I think you have to be able to accept that, especially if you're out working and you could get COVID. You don't want to be waiting for a vaccine that you get too late. And yeah. so I think you have to be able to balance all of that. Right. Absolutely. Um, and then... Uh... Patricia asks, and again, these are about prioritizing certain groups. Uh, Patricia asks, I have a son and a son-in-law, both in the trades that travel to Toronto daily into the hotspots for work, and then they return home to Durham. Uh, we know that these are areas of concern. Why are they not considered essential workers and prioritized for the vaccine? Uh, actually, they are considered essential workers. So the definition of essential workers, anyone that can't work from home, that's the very broad definition. And we expect that essential workers across the province will be eligible uh, sometime in May to get vaccinated. Okay, wonderful. And then we have a live question coming in here. I hope I pronounce your name correctly. Agle Nito asks, um, when, vac when will 17-year-olds uh, be eligible for vaccination? So right now, the prioritization framework that we have is for 18 plus. Um, and uh, we're currently working with, uh, on a, I, I can say that I'm helping to co-chair a, a, a committee, um, a working group looking at vaccinations for children. And so we know that Pfizer is licensed down to 16, but we expect that in the U.S. and soon in Canada that we will get licensure down to 12. And so we're actually starting to think about and to plan uh, when can and should children get vaccinated. I think it's important to know that the risks still are age-based. And so while children have gotten um, COVID, very tragically, one child has died of COVID. And that's something that nobody wants to see or hear about or know about. Um, the risks based on age, though, are where we're providing the vaccine. And that is where the higher risk is for now. But again, by June, uh, we should have a lot more vaccine be able to, once all of the adults get offered vaccine, maybe then it will go to children. Um, that's something to watch for. Okay. Um, and then, uh, let's see, Jill asks, um, my spouse has had vision problems 30 days post to get uh, getting the AstraZeneca vaccine. It looks like an optic nerve issue. Uh, and they finally saw an ophthalmologist. They're waiting for a temporal artery biopsy. How common is this side effect or is it a coincidence? I don't believe in coincidences. He is 61 and trains like an athlete. Okay, so I mean, it's a good question. We are vaccinating, in fact, worldwide, over 1 billion doses of vaccine have been given. When you give that many vaccines to that many people, days or weeks after the vaccination, life is going to happen and things are going to happen. And so what we have to be able to tease out is, was the whatever happened after vaccination caused by the vaccine or did it just happen afterwards in time? Hmm. And you don't need to determine that. What you need to do though, is see your doctor and get it reported. And by reporting it, we can then keep track of these side effects and determine whether it's caused by the vaccine or not. That's actually how that rare side effect 
developed after AstraZeneca was determined, yeah. actually in Europe, where it was given to millions of people, and they were finding that people within two weeks of vaccinating got this rare blood clot, and and then that's how they were able to detect it. So that is something that you need to do so that we can be sure, is it caused by the vaccine or is it just related uh, in time? Right. And doctor, have you heard of any uh, like optic issues, op ophthalmologic issues uh, in terms of academic? Yeah, no. So there have not been uh, any neurological or eye uh, concerns following vaccination related to the vaccines. But again, um, the more we give vaccines, the more we can look. We, sh we always have to keep looking to make sure that the vaccines remain safe. Right, absolutely. Um, uh, okay, a patient but concerned asks, my wife and I are in our 60s and we have received our AstraZeneca vaccines at a Toronto Shoppers Drug Mart on March 10th, but have not been able to get a date for our second shot. Uh, and they're seeing that others who are just getting their first vaccination now are already getting their date for their second shot. We have no interest in jumping the queue, but we want don't want to slip through the cracks. We've contacted the pharmacy, tried the government agencies. No one has any answers for us. What can we do? So the place where you got your vaccination is the place that you need to go to to book the next uh, to, to ask these questions. Uh, you are in the system. So I think I, I just want to assure you that way. All of the vaccines are being put into this provincial um, database called COVAX that has a generation to be able to book a second appointment. Mm -hmm. And so um, so that is there um, for the pharmacies. I think things may be doing being done a little bit differently compared to the to the broader clinics. You still have time um, before that second dose will be due, and so I think if closer to that four month mark, you still um, you still haven't heard from the pharmacy. You've gotten in touch with them. They can't give you advice. Then uh, then um, I'm sure there will be more guidance available then. Okay. Um and then Brittany asks, um, can the mRNA vaccines carry lipid nanoparticles across the placenta and harm the fetus in a pregnant woman? So there's actually, um, the science is showing that the messenger RNA actually does not uh, uh, go to the fetus. Um, and so that's, um, you know, it, it's injected in your arm. It actually doesn't last in your body for very long. It lasts for a few few uh, days or so, and then it's actually dispelled from your body, and it does not pass the placenta. But what can pass the placenta is when your body produces antibodies, mm -hmm. those antibodies can pass through the placenta, which is good because it can provide protection uh, to the growing baby. Right, right, okay. Um... Uh, are there, uh, so Salty asks, are there cases where people already vaccinated are getting um, COVID positive again? So the vaccine by and large is very effective. One dose, 80% protective, two doses, 90% protective. That was based on a study of the CDC using the messenger RNA vaccines. So we know that they're not 100%. So that's the first thing. Yes, some people can still get COVID, which is why, especially when COVID is, the rates are so high in our community, we have to follow precautions. Um, if you get COVID, though, and you're vaccinated, you're less likely to end up in hospital or to die from COVID. So that's one thing that you'll get a milder COVID. But the other piece to note is, well, when did you get COVID compared to when you were vaccinated? And it does take two weeks and some people up to three weeks before they develop that immunity, before their body has that immune response to protect them. Right. And if in that period you are exposed to someone, you catch COVID, the vaccine can't help you there. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we really need to be extra careful to prevent getting that, that infection. Right, absolutely. Um... And then Mike asks if uh, Mike and Hala actually have similar questions. So the question is, if the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine may cause a blood clot, is taking a low dose of aspirin um, before and after the vaccination a good idea to prevent the blood clot? So it's a good question. Um, there is no recommendation that people who are getting AstraZeneca go on blood thinners or take aspirin. The way that the blood clots occur with the AstraZeneca vaccine, it's different from the regular uh, blood clots. It's your, it's the platelets in your body that clump together and that's what causes the clot, which is different. It's a different mechanism. So the most important thing is if you get AstraZeneca is to watch for the symptoms. 
And if you have symptoms to seek medical attention. And so those symptoms are uh, trouble breathing, chest pain, tummy pain that doesn't go away, a severe headache, uh, bruising or spots on your skin or swelling in your legs. Okay, okay. Those are good to know to, to watch out for, for sure. Um, and then uh, Francis asks, what is the optimal time to get the first dose of the vaccine after recovering from COVID? As long as you're no longer contagious, you can get vaccinated. Okay. So um, there is no waiting period that you have to wait. Uh, as long as you're not, we don't want you to come to the clinic uh, if you're contagious. You need to really self-isolate. Um, but other than that, you can get vaccinated uh, as soon as possible. Right. Okay. Um, and then let's see. Uh, again, a prioritization question. Minnie asks, why are hospital healthcare workers not eligible for second shots despite working on the front line? Okay, so the second dose strategy applies to everyone, actually. Um, and so uh, hospital healthcare workers can mount a good immune response. I mean, unless they have had a transplant and, or are actively on chemotherapy, their body can actually provide them with a good response, which means that they can actually get good protection from one dose. Mm -hmm. And we know that that one dose protection lasts we know that it's strong. And by delaying that second dose, we're taking that population level approach so that we can vaccinate more people with that single dose, which is going to help everyone. It's going to help people keep people from getting COVID and from, from getting into the hospital. And so that's why even healthcare workers are um, taking the, are in the pool for that extended second dose. Now, if we get more vaccine than we anticipate, we can provide everyone their first dose and we're ready to go on to second doses early. Well, we can do that. We can do that. Right, absolutely. And like I think you've mentioned before several times now, everything has to do with vaccine supply right now as opposed to anything else. And, and having said that though, the four month gap is still um, effective. You said the vaccine is still effective after the four month gap. That's right. So that first dose is still gives you very good protection. And I think if we well, have to think about, you know, in Toronto, there were thousands and thousands of healthcare workers who got doses. If we're giving them their second dose early, that's thousands and thousands of hotspot uh, residents or essential workers who won't be able to get vaccinated. And so that's why it's a broader public health approach that's being used here. But it's based on science. I mean, the modeling studies show that you can prevent 10% fewer deaths by uh, using this approach. Okay, right. Um, and then we'll take some Twitter questions here. Um, True North has a bunch of questions. I'll start with the first one. How effective is one Pfizer shot against each variant of the vaccine, uh, of the virus, and how effective would two shots be? So um, we don't actually know how effective it is against every variant. I mean, there are constantly new variants that are coming on board. We know that in the UK, the UK variant, they used Pfizer and the vaccine works there. Uh, the, the second booster dose uh, is not so much about the variant. It's about boosting your own natural immune response uh, to the vaccine. So... Um, and even if the vaccine doesn't provide the perfect protection against whatever variant is that you want to know about, it can often provide cross protection. So it might be enough to at least keep you out of hospital, even if you got COVID, for example. Right. Um, and then uh, the follow up question is, how significant is the decrease in vaccine effectiveness when four months separate the first and second shot? So we know that um, the vaccine uh, works, that you get good protection after the first dose. So that CDC study showed 80% after the first dose. It was some people who didn't go back for their second dose, for example, and then 90% after the second dose with those messenger RNA vaccines. Mm -hmm. So we know that you get a, a good response. It's a strong response. And when the, even though we expect, you know, that your immunity may wane, it doesn't just fall off. And so um, if it wanes, it will wane slowly. If, even if it goes down to 77, 75, even 70%, by, this, by the time you get your second dose, that many more people around you will have been vaccinated. Hopefully the COVID rates will have declined uh, more um, to help you as well. That will also help you as well. 
Right, absolutely. And then uh, we have another question coming in live on Twitter right now. Uh, I guess we just addressed this, but let's let's do it definitively. Is there frequent discussion about moving the second doses up sooner to the manufacturer's recommended time frame, or are we just sticking to the four month plan permanently? So the four month plan is in place because of vaccine supply. So if we get an abundant vaccine supply, we can shorten that interval for sure. Um, I don't anticipate that we're gonna have more vaccine shortages that we need to extend the interval. That's not likely to happen, but we can certainly shorten that interval if we get uh, abundant vaccine supply for sure. Right, okay. Um... And then let's see. Uh, okay, this is an interesting one. We've got a, a couple of times from several different people. So I'll ask Jesse's question that came in on Twitter. Um, why is public health not promoting exercise, fresh air, vitamin D, and other activities and treatments that promote a healthy immune system and improved overall well being? Well, I, I, actually, uh, we do, um, and and I thank you for raising that because it is really important for everyone to look after their mental, mental and physical health. And so you'll see while we are at a stay-at-home order in Ontario, you can leave the house for essentials. And one of the essentials is to exercise, to get fresh air, to be outdoors. That is certainly something that's really important for your health, um, for many different reasons for your health, your mental health, your physical health, um, as well. So yes, that is definitely something that we recommend uh, every day to do it safely, though. Right, absolutely. And doctor, we've heard a lot about vitamin D. Um, and, uh, you know, another question of ours asked, uh, or suggests at least that vitamin D, uh, you know, if you have low doses of low uh, vitamin D in your body, you will stay in the hospital longer if you get COVID. Um, can you uh, talk about the importance of vitamin D or whether that, that's actually been the case in terms of low vitamin D levels? Yeah, we do know that uh, even based on age, that vitamin D is really important, especially in our climate in Canada, where you don't get the vitamin D comes naturally from the sun and we don't get a lot of that. Um, and so vitamin D, there are recommendations for vitamin D in general for your health. And so in general, if you have low vitamin D, taking vitamin D replacement is certainly something that's recommended. I think, though, the question of, well, will vitamin D help to prevent COVID or cure COVID? There's no data that I'm aware of that can answer that. But for other reasons, it's really important to make sure that you take, uh, take vitamin D if you need to. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then we have a couple of questions coming in live here about um, children and youth. Let's start with Maria's. Maria asks, what are the plans to vaccinate kids and youth under 18? Please share timelines. So there are no plans that are available right now, uh, but it is something that's been looked at. Um, and uh, so there will be plans that will be shared uh, in the future, absolutely. Right now, uh, none of the vaccines are licensed uh, past 16. Only Pfizer is licensed to 16. We are expecting that the FDA will approve it down to 12 for Pfizer. We're waiting for that. Usually then Health Canada will do their own review as well too. So there are a few still uh, still steps that, that need to occur before there can be a recommendation for, for Ontario. Right. Um, and then another question about kids here. Rose asks, are younger people 16 plus considered higher risk if they have a history of virus-induced asthma and hospitalizations with pneumonia? Uh, so uh, in general, we know that uh, children, including like less than 18, are lower risk compared to adults. So, um, and uh, in general, children who have got COVID, many children have gotten COVID. The number of children that have ended up hospitalized in ICU has been much lower comparison by comparison to adults. Uh, I think there's no question that someone who has uh, asthma or respiratory condition has to take good care because COVID can be more severe if you have those health conditions, regardless of your age. Right, right. Um, and then let's go back to these submitted questions that we have. Um, uh, Joe asks, is there any proven data about vaccine effectiveness or har harmfulness on people with COB COPD, MS, and any lung disease like bronchitis? Is there any proven data about the effectiveness or harmfulness? 
Yeah, so in the clinical trials, they actually did include people who had chronic health conditions, like some of the ones that you listed, and showed that the vaccine was safe in those people and that it actually worked in those people. And I think when you have chronic health conditions like COPD, uh, if you get COVID, you can get very sick, end up on a ventilator. Um, and so uh, that definitely would recommend the, the vaccine for you. Right, absolutely. Um, and then we actually just addressed this a minute ago, but I think we'll, let's ask this question properly. Vicky asks, I don't understand, get the vaccine and you're not protected before two weeks, and yet I can still get COVID six to, se six to eight months later after I get the vaccine. So do I start over with the vaccines again after that? Okay, so, so you get vaccinated and six months later you get uh, COVID. Uh, you don't need to get revaccinated. Um, we we do expect because the vaccines are not 100%, and because COVID is spreading so much that if you're vaccinated, you could get COVID, and uh, that is a possibility. You're less likely to get COVID, though, much less likely, and less likely to get a severe case of COVID. Now, if you got COVID, though, you wouldn't need to restart um, the vaccination series or get revaccinated. I think down the road, if we find that people are vaccinated and they're getting COVID, maybe because because there's a new variant, for example, there might be a booster dose that might be available. And at that point, uh, it would be recommended that you get, get another dose. Okay, that makes sense. And then um, we, we had this off the top of the uh, AMA, but let's ask again, because Penny might have missed it. Penny asks, has testing been done on mixing the types of vaccines, like the first shot with AstraZeneca and the second shot with Pfizer? Yes, uh, there are trials uh, ongoing on that. I just haven't seen any results on that. So, uh, so more to come. Okay. Um, and then, okay, let's go back to these submitted questions here. Uh, Stephen asks again about prioritization. What about people that are living with a disability in places like Toronto who don't live in one of the hot zones uh, and aren't over the current age range? When will they get their vaccine, people with disabilities? So actually, if you have a, a disability, uh, you actually may qualify right now for a vaccine as being in a high risk, having a high risk health condition. Right. That includes those with uh, intellectual or developmental disabilities uh, are eligible for vaccine right now, including a caregiver if there's someone who provides a direct care and support for you. So you could go on the website to find out, uh, to be clear on what the eligibility is too. You could also call the provincial hotline or even the Toronto Public Health Hotline, 416-338-7600, to go through your specific situation. Okay, wonderful. And, and that's, that's irrespective of whether they live in a hot zone or whether they're, they're, the, they're in the age group. That's irrespective of that, that the, the disability would qualify them. If it meets that criteria, exactly. So, you know, it's hard to, to determine just saying yes. disability, right? Um, so I think uh, better to get more clarification through the, through the call center, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and another live question coming in. This is an interesting one. DK asks, I did not get any reactions or side effects after receiving the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. Is it working or not? Uh, yes, uh, actually, the majority of people don't have side effects. Uh, it's really only uh, in the trials, it was about 10% of people who got uh, uh, side effects that, you know, were a bit more severe, that headache, not feeling well, a very sore arm rather than just a lightly sore arm. So, um, I, so actually, most people don't actually get any side effects. And it doesn't mean that the vaccine's not working. Absolutely not. Right. Okay, perfect. Uh, and we just have one minute left, and I'm going to go uh, into this question here from Shirley. Uh, I have had a small blood clot two years ago. I'm 56 years old and healthy otherwise. Am I able to get the AstraZeneca vaccine? So the thrombosis specialists, the hematologists, the doctors who deal with blood clots are very clear that the blood clots that occur from AstraZeneca are very different from the regular blood clots that do occur. Now, I would say if you have specific questions, talk to your doctor about it. Um, the, other, the other point, though, is if you live in Toronto in one of the hotspots and you're 45 or up, you could book a clinic, you could book uh, an appointment at one of the Toronto Public Health Clinics uh, now, and they are giving uh, Pfizer and uh, and Moderna. That being said, the AstraZeneca would very likely still be considered uh, uh, recommended for you. 
Right. Okay. And so that brings us to one o'clock. Uh, thank you, doctor, so much for answering all these questions so patiently for us. Thank you to everybody that contributed live and, uh, and in our cache of questions. We will have the doctor back with us next week. So if you didn't have a chance to ask your questions today, you can tune in next week. Thanks so much, doctor. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.